Today's topic, as we all know, is uh, endurance uh, through joy. Endurance through joy. As based on the book of Hebrews in chapter 12, verse 2, where the writer writes and says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Now, endurance means we face suffering and persecution, as many of endurance. And uh, the word for endurance is the word in Greek called hippomone. Hippomone means uh, to suffer and also to uh, persevere. And uh, we all face difficulties when we live for Jesus. And the context of this letter of Hebrews is basically to Jewish Christians, what we call Messianic Jews today, who when they first accepted Jesus, were full of joy and they joyfully accepted the confiscation of their properties. When they became believers in Jesus, many of them lost their properties and uh, the government, uh, uh, the authorities confiscated them. But they didn't mind it. But they knew that they had lasting possessions, heavenly possessions. But by the time the letter was written, they had lost their initial zeal for God. They had become a little lukewarm. And even though by this time they are supposed to be teachers of God's word, they need, they need the elementary teachings all over again. And the entire purpose of this letter was to encourage the Jewish Christians to understand who they come to believe in. The amazing personality of the Lord Jesus Christ, who he actually is. And that's why you find the first three chapters of the book of Hebrews. The writer exalts Christ above everything else that is very dear to the Jews. For the Jews, the prophets are very, very important. The priests are very, very important. Angels are very, very important. Angels. And also, uh, Moses. So all these things very dear to the Jews. The writer talks about how Christ is far superior to the prophets, to Moses, to the angels, and to the priesthood. And they need to remember who they have come to believe in. And they are going through difficulties. They had to endure. In fact, in chapter 10 of verse 36 of Hebrews, uh, uh, the writer writes about how uh, they are supposed to be people. You need to persevere. You need to persevere. When you've done the will of God, you receive what has been promised. You need to persevere. When you've done the will of God, you receive what has been promised. So here he's writing about how we have to endure difficulties in life. And Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith, who himself, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Now, for endurance, we need strength. Uh, we need strength to endure and we need wisdom to know why difficulties come our way. Now, how interesting to know that strength actually is a product of joy. Joy. In the book of Nehemiah, chapter 8, verse 10, very well-known verse, Nehemiah 8, 10, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Now we understand how the relationship between joy and endurance the joy God has given us is our strength. And through strength, we can endure. We can endure. Let's first talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. So the writer writes about how for, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. The cross was the shame, actually, those days. Because the Roman punishment for a heinous offense was crucifixion. And what they used to do was, they used to line up the uh, criminals along the highway, whether it's Roman highway, Apian way as they called it, or the highway near Jerusalem. There was a highway from Egypt to Mesopotamia that passed uh, very close to Jerusalem, adjoining the city, going up north, up to Megiddo, Har Megiddo, or, Meg uh, or Har Megadon as we say in English. From Har Megiddo, one route goes to Europe on highway, other one goes to Mesopotamia. They bifurcate. But they pass via Jerusalem. That's why Jesus was actually crucified uh, on the highway. Because that's why 
They will put all these crosses along the highway. And all the people who go along the highway, they look at the person hanging on the cross, read the name on the cross, the crime is committed, and that would be a deterrent for them not to do the crime. So it's, a, it's, a, it's a, actually a shame. Hang on a cross means it's a shame. And therefore, imagine the creator of heaven and earth hung on a cross. For the joy set before me endured the cross, scorning its shame. In the God of Gethsemane, we read about how when the Lord uh, prayed, he told the Lord, Lord in heaven, Father in heaven, 26 chapter of Matthew, verse 39, if possible, take this cup away from me. But let not my will, but your will be done. Say in the Father in heaven. Not my will, but your will be done. If possible, take this cup away from me. In other words, if possible, let me not go through this experience. And what was Jesus, if possible, trying to avoid? Was it the pain of the cross he was trying to avoid? What he really wanted to avoid, if possible, was the separation from the Father when he hung on the cross. Because he knew when he hung on the cross, the sins of the whole world would be nailed on the cross, unseen to the human eye, nailed to the cross. That's mentioned in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, 13 to 15. What was against us, was opposed to us, was nailed to the cross. He made a public spectacle of all our sins on the cross. Now, that's what he wanted to avoid because he knew the father will take his eyes off the son on the cross. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 says, God is so pure, he can't look upon evil. And on the cross, Jesus became a sin offering. In fact, the Bible says he became sin. He became sin offering. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5.21 It says, God made him who had no sin. Second Corinthians 5.21 God made him who had no sin to be sin for us. Meaning a sin offering for us. That in him we might become the righteousness of God. He became a sin offering on the cross. He knew as he ascended the cross, the Father will take his eyes off the Lord. Prophesied in Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a prophecy about the Messiah's words on the cross, which he fulfilled on the cross. Because the Father took his eyes off the Son when he hung on the cross, and Jesus knew that would happen. And that's why he says, if possible, Take this cup away from me. For eternity, the Father and Son were never separated. Before the world was created, they were there. I am that I am. John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And God is love. God is love. Now, before man was created, there was God. And God is love. And to manifest love, there must be an object of love. There's nothing to love. How can you manifest love? So his God is love. Whom did God love before the world was created? There was perfect love within the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's why at one point of time he entered the world. He prays to the Father. For the disciples, he tells the Father in John 17, 26, I have made you known to them and I will continue making you known that the love you have for me will be in them and I myself will be in them. The love you have for me. So there's perfect love within the Trinity. You know, the, uh, love means also that you are humble, you will lift up other person more than yourself. You glorify other person. There is no pride in love. And we see that perfect harmony within the Trinity. The Father glorifies Jesus. John 5.22 Jesus glorifies the Father. 
John chapter 10, verse 30. The Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. John 16, 14. And Jesus glorifies the Holy Spirit. Matthew 12, 31, 32. The baby those verses. Jesus glorifies the Father. John 10, 30. The Father glorifies Jesus. John 5, 22. Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. John 16, 14. And Jesus glorifies the Holy Spirit. Matthew 12, 31, 32. Expression of love. Putting another person above yourself. There's perfect love within the Trinity. And Christ knew when he went up the cross, the Father will take his eyes off the Lord. For six hours, the Father and the Son would be separated. For eternity, only for six hours, they were separated. And the prospect of being separated from the Father was too much for Jesus. And he says, if possible, take this cup away from me. Then he says, but not my will, but your will be done. And what is the joy I said before? He endured the cross, not just the shame of people watching him on the cross and, oh, he's, he's a, he did this, he's among two murderers, among two thieves. He thinks he's the king of the Jews. That's not the shame. As much as the fact that he would be cut off from the father, that's what he would have tried to avoid if possible. But then he knew God's will had to be done. So we read in the Bible, 26th chapter of Matthew, 22 to 54. We read about how when, when they arrested Jesus, one among them in the group was Malchus, the servant of the high priest, who was instrumental in Jesus being arrested. When Peter sees that, he takes a sword and cuts off Malchus' ear. We could not bear the servant of the high priest to be among people arresting the Messiah. Now, these Jews are very, very, uh, you know, they're chauvinistic people, uh, very racist, hierarchical. They could not bear to see the servant of the high priest among those arresting Jesus. He takes the um, uh, sword and cuts off his ear. The Lord puts his, uh, the ear back in place. He tells Peter, those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And he said, tells him, don't you know? If I call upon the Father, he'll have at once give at my disposal 12 legions of angels who rescue me from this hour. But how then will the will of the Father take place, which says, it must happen this way? It, happened to ha it had to happen this way. He had to be crucified because. Sins had to be paid for. Only the perfect Son of God could pay the price for sins. He had to die on a cross. He had to be crucified. According to the Jews, he had committed a grave sin against the Jewish faith. The reason why they wanted to arrest him is basically jealousy. But the excuse they had was that, number one, he called God his father. Number two, Healed on the Sabbath day. John 5, 18. It is in John 5, 18. For this they wanted to kill him. For this reason. Not only healed on the Sabbath day, he called God his father. In other words, making himself to be equal with the father. They would have killed him because of that. By that logic, he would have had to be stoned to death. Not crucified. He had to be stoned to death. That is punishment, the Jewish punishment for a grave sin. But then they prophesied in the Bible, in Isaiah 53, 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. Not only that, just like he became a sin offering, he had to become a curse to redeem us from all curses. Galatians 3, 13 says, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, but became a curse himself, because curse be any man who hangs on a tree. So because he had to become a curse, because he had to be pierced for our transgressions, he was crucified on the cross. He knew that was the will of the Father. It had to happen this way. 
So he went to the cross for the joy set before him. What was that joy? That joy was having you and me in heaven with him forever and ever. The prospect of all of us living with him for eternity was the joy set before him because of which he endured the cross, scorning its shame. Now look at you and me. It says in the Bible, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. He's the author of your faith and perfecter of faith. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Just like he had the joy of having you and me with him in heaven, we have the joy of having all of us and with him in heaven. Same joy. Can you imagine that? Are we going through a cross that we have been crucified like this? He was sinless. For our sake, he took all that. One small pinprick, we got so upset in life. And then verse 3, writer says, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. They did not grow weary and lose heart. Don't grow weary and lose heart. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men. They won't grow weary and lose heart. So example for, a, for, our, for us in, in life, as you obey him, we'll all face difficulties. And remember, he's already given us his joy. For him, the joy set before him was, after he goes to the cross, all of us will have salvation. For you and me today, we already have the joy. We already have the assurance. He's given us that joy. And since we have joy today, you can go through the suffering that we have to face today. In his case, joy was set before him, prospect, future. And he went through separation from the father for the joy set before him. In our case, we've been given that joy. We've been given that peace. We have the joy. We have the peace. So God says, you take up your cross and follow me. Just like I went through the cross to have you and me in heaven, that was my joy. You also have the same joy. I've given it to you already. Because today we have been given salvation. Peace and joy is our portion today. Already given to us. How? Because today, having accepted Jesus, we are in the kingdom of God. We crossed over from the domain of darkness into his kingdom. To the cross. In Colossians chapter 1, 13, 14, we read. Colossians chapter 1, 13, 14. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and has brought us the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Kingdom of God is power. 1 Corinthians 4, 20. He gives us power to resist temptation, to live for him, power to face difficulties in life. And as we walk with him, we preserve this joy. We preserve this peace. In John chapter 15, verse 11, 9, 10, 11 actually, John 15, 9, 10, 11, we read, the Lord says to the apostles, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Remain in my love. If you obey my commandments, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commandments and remain in love. I have told you this, that, that my joy will be in you and your joy will be complete. In John 16, 33, in similar spirit, he speaks about peace he's given us. I've told you these things, that in me you will have peace, in the world you will have troubles, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So, through the cross, we come to the gift of salvation, we receive salvation, with the assurance of salvation, we know we're going to be with him in heaven, forever and ever, joy of belonging to him, Enjoying fellowship with him, we have been given that promise, and therefore we obey him to preserve that peace and joy. Let's not forget on the cross, 
He took away our punishment and gave us peace. By becoming a sin offering, that offering was the payment for the sins of the whole world. Becoming a sin offering, he took away punishment and gave us peace. Today we preserve that peace by obedience. We preserve the joy by obedience. And when we obey, we'll face difficulties in life. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12 says, If anyone chooses to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, he'll be persecuted. If we choose to live a godly life, it's a choice we make. We can avoid it. We can avoid a godly life. We can do, live our own life. We, we, we lose the joy of salvation. We don't lose salvation. We lose the joy of salvation. Like, for example, David, when he sinned against God, he's praying, Lord, restore to me the joy of salvation. Joy is a knowing for sure we are going to go to heaven when we leave this world. The primary purpose of our faith in Christ should be salvation. The goal of our faith should be the salvation of our souls. This is why the people whom Peter wrote the letter, they had unspeakable joy, indiscoverable joy. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 8 and 9, he writes to them, even though you have not seen him, you love him. If they don't see him now, even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's ask ourselves, what's the goal of our faith? Why do you believe in Jesus? Just for things of this world? To get a job, to get a promotion, to get a name in society, to be popular, to achieve something in life? To make money, to have power, popularity, possession. Is that why we believe in Jesus? Yes, sometimes God gives us these things to us. When you follow him, these things follow us. We don't follow these things, we follow the shepherd. And goodness and mercy follow us everywhere. Is that the reason why we believe in Jesus? These people who had indescribable joy were people who believed in Jesus because of salvation. When you accept Christ into your hearts as Savior and Lord, He comes and dwells in us through His Spirit. We become the children of God at that point of time. And because we are God's children, at that point of time, He puts His Spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing an inheritance. Guaranteeing. Ephesians 1.14 Who has guaranteed? God has guaranteed. Will He break a guarantee? Human beings make break promises, but not God. So he lives in us as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. Christ in us means hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 Christ in you, hope of glory. The fundamental question is, to every human being, is Christ in us? If today they are very uh, very gray area of definition of who is a Christian. We don't know who is a Christian is not a Christian. You have, may have a Christian name, but it may not be a Christian at all. A Christian is someone who has Christ put in him or her. Romans 8, 9 says, Romans 8, 9, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. Belongs to Christ means Christian. This meaning of Christian belongs to Christ. Who belongs to Christ? Someone who has Christ put in him or her. And once he comes to our hearts, he lives in us forever. Now you know why the Apostle Paul put a question to the church in Corinth. The Corinthian church were known for all kinds of sins. And there are all kinds of people in the church, like today also in many churches, almost every church for that matter, or rather in every congregation, there are genuine believers, those who walk in the spirit. There are those who are believers but walk in the flesh. There are unbelievers. There are seekers. There are scoffers. There are mockers. There are spectators. There are reporters. 
go tell other people what's happening in this church. There are gossip mongers, curious onlookers, all kinds of people come. On a given Sunday morning in many churches, all kinds of people come. You can't stop someone from coming to a congregation. At a given point of time in a congregation, different kinds of people, any Christian gathering, different kinds of people are there. And the Apostle Paul put a question to the church in Corinth. Second Corinthians, 13 chapter 5 and 6. Examine yourself to see if you are in the faith. Test yourself. Don't realize he lives in you, that Christ lives in you. Unless, of course, you fail the test. I trust you will discover we have not failed the test. Paul was sure about passing the test. He lives in me. Examine yourself. Is he in you? That's the ultimate question. Is Christ in you? If he's in you, you have hope of glory. If he's not in you, no hope of glory. How to remove that doubt? Repent, believe, ask him to come in your heart. As simple as that. As simple as that. And thereafter, live for him. So this church in Corinth, with all kinds of difficulties they had, divisions were there, there was lawsuits among believers, there was incest in the church, sexual immorality, all kinds of things were happening. So Paul put a question to them. Examine yourself. Test yourself. Is Christ in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. I trust you will discover we have not failed the test. Meaning, Paul and his companions. About him personally, he writes to the Galatians, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. But you know he lives in you, we have the assurance of salvation. We have the hope of salvation. Christ in us, hope of glory. And we rejoice in the hope of that glory. Romans chapter 5, verse 2. We rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, we rejoice in our suffering. Now let's connect that with what written in the book of Hebrews. The joy set before him, he endured the cross. Endurance is suffering actually. To endure is hippomeno. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a verb, hippomeno. Hippomone is endurance. And hippomeno actually means to suffer, to persevere, to endure. So we endure suffering through joy. How wonderful it is. Because we have joy. We know we're going to go to heaven. We don't mind difficulties because, in fact, these difficulties are creating for us extra glory in heaven, rewards in heaven. I'll come a little later, I'll come to that. But first of all, let's understand Christ in us means hope of glory. And we rejoice, is a verb. Correspond noun for rejoicing is joy. We have joy, so we rejoice. We rejoice, why? In the hope of the glory of God. Christ in you, hope of glory. He always lives in us. We always have the hope of glory. So we always have joy. So we can always rejoice. Why should rejoicing be depend upon circumstances? Happiness depends on circumstances. Not joy. Joy is independent of circumstances. Joy is in the heart. Christ is in the heart. We know, we leave this world, we're going to go to heaven. While living here, we choose to live for him. And as we live for him, we preserve that joy. So the Lord says, remain my love. If you obey my commandments, commandments, remain my love. Just as my father's commandments, remains love. I've told you this, that my joy will be in you. So as we have joy, that joy is strength. Because when you have difficulties coming your way, the joy you have will give you the motivation to go through it. My Lord went through it. In our case, we already have joy, so we face difficulties. In his case, of course, he had the perfect joy. He is God himself, become man. But those specific joy set before him. It not yet happened. Till he is crucified, the, the assurance of all of them, become, all of us being with them was not there. Only when to the cross, 
He purchased us by his blood on the cross. That purchase was not yet made till he ascended the cross. By the blood he purchased us. So before the purchase, the joy of enjoying us in heaven, joy of purchasing us was his joy. Look at this amazing scene in the book of Revelation in chapter 5, 9 and 10. Where the 24 elders and the four living creatures, first four living creatures worship the Lord in words, chapter 4 verse 8. Then the 24 elders worship the Lord in words, Revelation chapter 4 verse 11. Then together they worship the Lord in song. First words, then in song. All together, they could not bear but worship God. They just outflowing the joy. When the Lamb of God took the scroll from the hand of the one sitting on the throne, the Ancient of Days, the Father in Heaven, all of them sing to Him. Revelation chapter 5, 9 and 10. You are worthy to take the scroll and open the seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you purchase men for God from, from every tribe and language and people and nation. May them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they'll reign on the earth. So before he purchased, before the cross, he went through this experience in the Garden of Gethsemane. He probably take the cup away from him, but not my will, but your will be done. So before he could purchase, he went through that. You know, that experience in, uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. And the joy set before him of enjoying our fellowship in heaven made him endure the cross. Today, says you and me have been purchased by his blood. The purchase has been made. We are bought by his blood. We belong to him. We have been given joy. So how much more with that joy given to us already, we can endure. We can easily endure. And to endure... He gives us wisdom and strength. Wisdom to know, first of all, why we face trials and suffering. We endure hardships. Some hardships are there because we do something wrong. We pay the consequences for it. Some hardships are because of our obedience to God. Difference, we will know. We ask the Holy Spirit to help us. In the book of First Peter, Chapter 4, from verse 12, we read. First Peter, chapter 4, verse 12 onwards, Peter writes, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the painful trial you're suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, that you may be old joy when the glory is revealed. If you're insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. The Spirit of God and of God rests upon you. If you suffer, shouldn't be as a murderer or a thief or any other criminal or even as a meddler. But if you suffer as a Christian, don't be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. We suffer as a Christian. The word Christian is used only three times in the Bible. Three times the word Christian is used. One is Acts 11.26. The Sabbath of the Court Christian in Antioch, Acts 11 26. The Sabbath of the Court Christian in Antioch. Then here, 1 Peter 4 16. And then later on, you find King Agrippa asking uh, Paul, 20 chapter of Acts, verse 28 29, 28 verse actually. Do you think in a short time you can make me a Christian? You convince me to become a Christian? Three times what Christian is used. Belongs to Christ, it means. So, as we realize, the amazing joy of belonging to him, we can face every trial and God gives us wisdom to know why we face trials. The first question when I go through suffering is, Holy Spirit, counsel me. He will give us wisdom to understand the will of God in this. Every trial is the will of God in everything. Sometimes we go through difficulties for our, for our mistakes, even there's a will purpose in it. God allows us to go through for a purpose to teach us something. Other times we go through suffering for uh, standing for the Lord, rewards in heaven. Either way, there's a lesson to be learned. So we should understand the will of God in difficulties. And Colossians chapter 1, 
from verse 9. Colossians chapter 1 from verse 9, Paul writes, Since we heard about you, we not stop praying for you. Asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this, that we live lives worthy of God, pleasing him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in his knowledge, being strengthened with all power for his glorious might, and we have really endurance and patience, endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share the inheritance saints in the kingdom of light. Endurance and joy. See, because of connection, we qualified to share the inheritance saints in the kingdom of light. And enduring joyfully. There is a direct connection between joy and endurance. Joy, strength, and endurance. The law, joy of the Lord is our strength. When you know you're going to go to heaven, you're such excited about it, excitement about it, that you're bubbling with joy, waiting to go to heaven. I'm ready to go to heaven actually, because God wants me there after I finish my work. Till then I won't go, don't worry. I'll be here till God finishes my work, whatever he has planned for me. But then just look at the Apostle Paul, what he writes. Philippians 1.21 For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Romans 14.8 If we live, we live to the Lord. To die, we die to the Lord. And once we leave this world, He's waiting for us in heaven. It's precious to God. Our death is precious to God. There will be a great celebration there. We'll receive a rich inheritance into God's kingdom. But here, while living for Him, please don't complain in trials. Rejoice. The hope of the glory of God. And that joy and rejoicing will give us the strength. That's the joy of the Lord, actually, for us today in the New Testament. Joy of the Lord. Give us strength to face every trial. Endure every trial. That's why the Apostle Paul encouraged Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5. Endure hardships. Endure hardship. But he tells him, as a good soldier for Christ. Every hardship doesn't go immediately. And the wonderful thing is, you wonder, why me, Lord? Why this hardship for me, Lord? Those hardships in the will of God are creating for us eternal glory in heaven. Great rewards in heaven they have in store for us. Of course, we don't go to trial just to get rewards. We go to trial because we love God. We want to please Him. We want to obey Him Whatever be the consequences, out of love for him. In that process, but default, we'll have rewards in heaven. The Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy about not being ashamed about the gospel, not being ashamed about Paul the prisoner. He says, 2 Timothy 1.8, John had been suffering for the gospel by the power of God. 11th and 12th verse, he writes, of this gospel, I was made a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. That's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced he's able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. For the day of great price distribution. One day. You know, the 11th chapter of Hebrews, uh, List different people in the Bible, how they all lived by faith, they ministered by faith, did wonderful things for God by faith. All of them, whole list of people. This chapter is called the Hall of Fame of Faith, nickname given by the theologians to the 11th chapter of Hebrews. And verse 39 and 40 says, 11th chapter, 39 and 40 of Hebrews, they were all commended for their faith, but none of them received what is promised. God had planned something better for us, for us. Now, along with us, they be made perfect. Perfect means complete. Context here is made complete. What God promised him rewards, he'll get them at that time. We'll also get at that time. Store for me, Paul says. On that day, he will give. So as we live for the Lord here and face difficulties, 
as we store up treasures in heaven through our service to God, on that day, judgment day for believers, it is basically degrees of rewards. Prize distribution ceremony. Prize distribution ceremony. That day, we all have rewards. But for me, I am sure for you also, the greatest reward is simply being with Jesus. For him, he endured the cross for the joy set before him of you and me, just being with him in heaven to purchase us by his blood. He paid a very great price to purchase us. What price have we paid to get the same reward? He enjoying us, we enjoying him. He paid a price, we paid no price. Sometimes what happens, no? When people give up their jobs and go for ministry, we are so uh, materialistic sometimes. They say, oh, we give everything, we go on to ministry, how much the sacrifice he's made. What sacrifice? What sacrifice can any one of us make compared to what he's done for us? Giving up a job, earthly job, doing ministry, sacrifice, they say, what sacrifice? I've given up so much. Look at the way I'm living, simple way I'm living. Look at the sacrifice he made. Creator of heaven and earth, he left the glory in heaven, entered the world, became man, humbled himself, became obedient of death, even death on a cross. What a sacrifice he made for us. And together with him, we we'll enjoy heaven. And even the beautiful thing is, whatever he has, he is giving to us. Romans 8 17 and 18. If you're children, we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering, in order we share in his glory. John 12, 26. He told the disciples, John 12, 26, whoever serves me must follow me. All of us are his servants. We're all called to do his will. And he says, whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Where he is today, we are going to be. We are co heirs with Christ. What an amazing prospect that is. I hear it's more real problem, they complain. Why me? Why me, Lord? What are you going to be with me in heaven, next to me? Seated with me in the heavenly places. Look at the joy set before you. You already have joy of salvation. When you come here, you'll have unspeakable joy. So can't you go through little difficulties for you to store up treasures in heaven? Every trouble we go through here in the will of God is creating for us eternal glory in heaven. In fact, in Romans 8, 18, Paul writes, I consider a present suffering is not worth comparing to the glory that has been given to us. The glory available for us. I'm not worth comparing. Ratio of glory to suffering is so high, it's not worth even talking about it. So thank God for the amazing prospect we have. And while we go through little pinpricks in life, don't complain. Philippians chapter 2, 14, 15, and 16. Do everything without complaining or arguing. Then it may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation. As you shine like stars in us, as you hold out the word of life. When you face oppression in this world, oppression from Christians we face sometimes, from unbelievers we face, from family members we face, all the oppression we face. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, and chapter 12, verse 3, Hebrews 12, 3, written, Consider him who endured such oppression from sinful men that he won't grow weary and lose heart. Never grow weary. They happen to grow weary, what do you do? Go to him. He gave us a blank check. Matthew 11, chapter 28 to 30. Come to me all weary and burden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon yourself and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, you will find rest for your souls. Our yoke is easy, my burden is light. Just imagine all of us, sinful as we were, sinful as we are even today in many ways, he has given us his deposit of salvation, of assurance of salvation, the promise of abundant life in this world. 
He's given us his word to go and share. Just imagine what a privilege to be spokesman and spokeswoman of the living God. He just said, ha, you know, it came to existence. He spoke, you know, it came to existence. That word he spoke, by the word the heavens were created. He's given us that word to speak. What a privilege it is to be spokesman, spokeswoman of the living God. Enjoy this word, enjoy this life of walking with him each and every day. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. With that strength, you can face trials, you can endure. If you endure, we will reign with him. If you endure, we'll reign with him. And we'll reign with him forever and ever in heaven. Praise God. Praise God with amazing grace. I want to pray. God gives us wisdom to analyze anything we go through, why we're going through. That he'll fill us with the knowledge of his will. We'll never go weary or lose heart. Or we'll rejoice in him because this peace and joy is a joy in the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom of God. Romans 14, 17. The kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. Righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So endurance comes from joy because joy of the Lord is our strength.